to the fourth day of Faculty Development Program, an international webinar series on advanced material research. You can ask your queries by typing in the chat box. All the queries will be clarified at the end of the session. I request Dr. Sophia Mann, the academic in charge of HNS, to greet everyone. Morning, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome uh, to the fourth session of this uh, faculty development program. All of you are on time. And, uh, we are going to start. Uh, I hope that you are enjoying uh, the lectures every day. The first day, uh, we listen. Uh, to a lecture about introduction to semiconductor materials and laser materials, right? The second day, uh, we listened about materials under extreme conditions. And the third day, we listened to a very special lecture. Uh, it's about soft skills, about path-breaking mentorship. And today is going to be much more special. Uh, it's going to be about introduction to machine learning. All of us belong to science backgrounds, and uh, I'm sure that may, many of you are coming across uh, many journals and publications that relate material science and machine learning. When I was in uh, DRDO, I could listen to a lecture about how our data can be useful in uh, you know, uh, making materials uh, discovery in a faster pace. For example, uh, for a material to be launched in a defense field, it takes around 12 or 15 years. That's what I heard from the senior scientists there. Because once you uh, find out which material is useful, uh, you will have to test it again and again. And uh, it should have a reliable performance consistently. And uh, it has to uh, go in with all the you know, materials uh, processing. You know, it has to comply with uh, joining with other kind of equipments or components in a machine. And uh, finally, it has to be tested in the field. And it has to be certified. Then by the time uh, we start uh, doing a research on a material, and by the time you launch a product, it takes a minimum of uh, uh, 10 years. But then uh, uh, this machine learning arrived, and then uh, there is a concept of pulling in all the data, the research data that we generate from all parts of the world, and the machine will think and come to a quicker conclusion which material is better for us and why, right? And uh, this is going to be amazing. And it's a pretty new field as of now. And for this, we thought uh, that we should learn the introduction, the foundations of machine learning. We just have to know what is machine learning. You know, how does a machine learn? You know, it's like, how do you teach a machine to learn, right? So uh, we found a very eminent speaker. He's from Georgia Tech. He did his uh, artificial intelligence course in Georgia Tech. And uh, he is the best person to tell us what is machine learning. So today, uh, it's going to be very interesting. A new topic to us, the basics. And uh, I have heard his lectures before. It's very clear. So I want you to concentrate. You know, I don't want you to move here and there. You know, you don't do kind of juggling because you will uh, miss out many things so if you can spare your uh, next 50 to 60 minutes and listen patiently uh, you are uh, going to you know get a foundation in your mind so i wish you uh, a very uh, best time ahead and uh, i welcome all of you on behalf of uh, uh, bharat institute of uh, technology and uh, I really thank the speaker uh, to give us his precious time 
and to give us his uh, kind of lecture all the way from us uh, thank you very much sir and uh, happy listening thank you our keynote speaker for today's session is mr jewel he completed his bs in computer science from georgia institute of technology his relevant coursework include design and analysis of algorithms systems and networks introduction to ai his work experience in amazon seattle as a software development engineer where he has designed and implemented internal pub sub service for live order update notification created architecture using aws service utilize inversions of control with spring when developing services completed extra work sprint work for team for migration to a newer service also worked for honeywell atlanta as software engineer where he developed mapping and overlay features for a drone flight plane software redesigned 3d maps rendering with a custom tiling algorithms to improve ui speed and fluidity architectured and implemented api layers and a number of projects that include vr game development where he has used unity and blender to develop a zero gravity vr shooter with realistic movemental physics second project is snake ai he developed a neural network to play snake trained with a genetic algorithm followed by safe park and palette where he designed a web application to raise awareness for and provide information on local elections it's my honor to welcome you sir is everyone able to hear me yes yes sir okay uh, let's see i'll begin sharing my screen uh first i i think um whoever is sharing their screen now will have to uh stop sharing yeah. their screen so that i'm able to Okay. Yes. So thank you. Okay, is everybody able to see the presentation? Yes, sir. Awesome. Okay. So um before we begin, I I want to say thank you um to all of you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Um it's an honor to be able to share all this knowledge that I've uh, gained um at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um yeah, so I'm excited to present to you um an intro to machine learning so to start off um these are the topics that i will be talking about today so the main things that i want to go over um with you is what is machine learning um and how can a problem be identified as suitable to be solved by machine learning um as well as what some of the key concepts in machine learning are and how all of these topics can relate to material science So let's begin with the first topic. We need to understand what exactly machine learning is. So in order to do this, we have to address a few more things. Um, first, we should address traditional computing, um, and then we can move on to talking about artificial intelligence. And then once we understand artificial intelligence a little more, we can then move on to defining machine learning itself. So, what is traditional computing? um i'm sure many of us understand uh these days a lot of computer programs are um quite simple at least basic computer programs are they always use algorithms which are usually a list of steps to solve basic problems so if you give an input and an algorithm to a computer it's able to generate an output um and solve whatever problem that you have designed that algorithm to solve in other words to solve a problem you simply have to tell the computer what to do exactly Now artificial intelligence is a little bit different um than traditional computing. So traditional computing use uh, is usually defined as a computer simply following a list of steps. But artificial intelligence is when a computer can perform something viewed as smart. So it's important to note that AI doesn't actually need to learn um contrary to popular belief. So one example of this is um chess AIs. 
So as early as 1997, um, IBM created a chess AI called Deep Blue that was able to win against the then champion chess player. But none of this chess program um, used any machine learning, which is amazing to think about. Um, and this is actually just a very simple search algorithm, meaning when you're playing chess, um, the, all the computer does is check all the different possible moves that it needs to do, um, but it efficiently guesses which moves it should explore first. And by doing that, um, the chess AI can essentially figure out at least close to the best possible move relatively quickly. But note that in that scenario, the program is not actually learning and instead is already taught how to play chess to begin with. The same can be said about video game characters. A lot of video games um, these days offer AI characters who can either play alongside a human player or against a human player. But a lot of these characters, though they seem like full-blown humans with, uh, with personalities and with actions and thinking, um, they're simply just a list of different rules um, that can interact with the environment in a way to make them seem like they are human, even though they are not exactly human. So what's important to note here is that artificial intelligence does not always have to learn in order to be a smart program. So this brings us to machine learning. So machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And this subset of artificial intelligence is the type of program that actually does learn. And by learn, we mean that a system is provided with data and the computer must learn a model that is then used to solve the problem. In other words, rather than telling the computer what to do, you show the computer how to solve the problem. So, these are, a lot of the, these are a lot of major topics that machine learning works well in solving. So it's important to note that machine learning cannot solve everything, and it's not an end-all, be-all solution to a lot of today's problems. But it can be very incredibly useful in, pro in problems that deal with these four major um, types of problems. So the first is clustering, in the sense that if you have a large data set and you need to find out groupings and patterns in data that are hard to, def uh, hard to see as a human, um, machine learning can really help um, find those clusters and those different patterns. Another is classification. If we're given a large set of data and each data is tagged with a certain label or it is a certain type of, uh, of something, then machine learning is effective at learning how to distinguish different data points as different labels. Another uh, problem type is prediction. So given a lot of past data points, machine learning has been very useful in predicting uh, either future data points or similar results to what the data that you have given it. And finally, machine learning is very good at optimizing de uh, decision making. So why is this useful? Well, in some cases, it's actually not. Like I said earlier, machine learning does not work well with traditional deterministic programs. What deterministic programs mean is essentially any program where a system is clearly defined with rules and there is no unknown variable. If you know everything about how to solve a problem, we can easily code that with traditional computing. This is very useful instead when you don't know everything about, um, about a problem. So I see in a chat um, a raised hand. Uh, I'm not sure, should I address that now or am I, should I address that at the end? So you can address that at the end, sir. Okay, uh, okay. I'll come back. Um, if, you guys, if anyone has any questions, I'll look through the chat at the end and come back and I'll be happy to clarify. Um, so as I was saying, um, machine learning is useful when we don't know how a problem is solved. It's also useful when we don't fully understand how we as humans can solve a problem. So a good example of that is recognizing speech in sound. Now, whenever we hear a word like cat, we understand what that means, but we may not necessarily understand how we know, how that, know what that means. Um, in this case, machine learning can help us figure out ways to create an algorithm to solve these problems, even if we do not know the clear-cut rules of defining that problem. Another situation in which machine learning is very useful is when there are different individual cases for the problem. So this can refer to things like um, personalized medical programs, um, things such as personal news feeds. All of these examples are examples in which the different, uh, the results of a 
program need to depend on somebody's personal preferences and past experiences. Finally, machine learning can also be useful when traditional computing cannot calculate something with a large amount of data. Machine learning, thankfully, is very good at dealing with large, large databases of data. So in order to understand what machine learning can better do for us, um, we need to understand what a machine learning problem looks like. So these parts are defined by Tom Mitchell in 1998. Machine learning algorithms improve performance at a certain task with experience. So we'll look, we'll look at an example for this to kind of better frame um, what that means. So let's look at MNIST. MNIST is a very large database of handwritten digits, zero through nine. These digits are written in very small image files. Uh, and this data set contains over 70,000 samples, all of which are labeled with the correct digit that each drawing represents. So the ML problem here, we can break up into those three, um, those three uh, sections that I, uh, that I described earlier. So the task in this, in this scenario is recognizing which digit is written. The experience is the labeled pairs of images and the corresponding digit. The performance is the percentage of correctly recognized digits. So when we look at this from a machine learning perspective, we can identify these three parts of the machine learning problem to better understand how to solve it. As long as we know that we need to basically identify a handwritten digit as a digital digit using the experience, which are the given, uh, given, given paired labels, um, and we need to improve the performance by increasing the percentage of correctly recognized digits, we can then move on to approaching how to solve this problem. So to simplify what I said, when we're looking at these handwritten digits, we need to represent the task as a function. We need to then optimize this function with the given experience. And then we have to evaluate the performance. And these three steps are not only uh, applicable to this specific example, but they actually apply to every machine learning problem. Every algorithm that is designed um, for an ML-based problem has these three parts. There's representation, which is how we convert the problem into a mathematical model that we can work with or a computer-based model that we can work with. Then there's optimization, which is taking this model and modifying this model to make sure that it fits our solution. And then there's evaluation, which is making sure that our model after training is up to the standards that we need in order to get the proper solution. So that's all good and well. We now know the basic structure of all machine learning algorithms. But there are, varying, there are very different problems when it comes to machine learning. So one of the examples I gave you was handwritten digits recognition. So we can define this as a classification problem in the sense that we are given a certain data point, which consists of all of the pixels in the small image that is drawn at a, as a digit. We can then classify that data point into one of 10 bins, the digits zero through nine. However, if we look at a problem such as email spam filtering, this may not necessarily work well with classification. There are lots of different things that can go into an email that define it as a spam email. So this is better described as a clustering problem. If we plot all of, diff all of the different emails that you receive in a specific feature space, which I'll explain later, um, we can then look for clusters in the data to figure out which cluster of data is a regular email and which cluster is a spam email. So another problem is personalized news recommendations. So a popular feature these days in news apps, um, for example, Google News, is a personalized news feed that is modified to your own personal preferences. So based on your past activity on that app, the app will adjust what kind of news articles it shows you. This can be classified as a prediction type of problem. So as you can see, these different problems seem like they might have a lot of different aspects that we need to consider before we can actually attempt to solve them. And this is correct. Um, there is actually, for each of these problems, there are different ways to represent each problem. There are also different ways to optimize the models for the problem. And there are different ways to evaluate the success of the models. So, 
in order to basically go over a lot of these different ways, we're going to delve into the different types of machine learning. So obviously this graphic looks very daunting. There's lots of, lots of different words on here, lots of different types of machine learning. Um, but I'm going to be focusing on just the three big circles that surround machine learning. That is supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforced, reinforcement learning. So these three types of machine learning are some of the key types that you can use to kind of approach a problem and at least have a basic idea of how to solve it. So let's begin with supervised learning. Supervised learning is when we feed a system input-output pairs of data that are known to already be correct. The system then learns a function to map those inputs to the outputs that you have given. Essentially what happens then is you take this model um, and you are able to train this model to react to the correct inputs and outputs so that when you are giving it a new input that is not part of your training data set, you are able to correctly classify it um, as what you were class or as uh, what the what the training data was used to classify for. So this type of learning is very useful when there is a lot of labeled data. So let's look at a basic type of supervised learning. So essentially, sup like regression um, is one of the main types of supervised learning that um, is used in application very uh, often these days. So Basically, a model in regression is, repre is represented as a numerical function. So if we look at the data for numerical functions um, that are in regression, we are given pairs of data, um, which we can represent as x1 and y1, x2, y2, and so on, um, where x is the input and y is the output. We essentially just need to find a function that approximates f of x equals y. The thing is, in a lot of machine learning applications, a lot of the functions that we need to approximate can be very complex and have lots of different variables that we ourselves cannot even see. So in order to make this into a machine learning problem instead of a simple regression problem, we instead introduce linear regression as well as polynomial regression and even logistic regression. Essentially, we can fit many different types of math mathematical models and, and we can test to see which type of mathematical models that our data best fits. What we can do then is we can find, uh, we, we can estimate initial parameters for these models, um, calculate the error between the expected output and the output that our model is currently giving us. And using that error, we can slowly tune the coefficients in our function. By slowly tuning these coefficients and slowly reducing the error, over time, over many different iterations, we can slowly reduce the error in the function to approach, um, to approach and good like a, a sufficient estimation of what the actual function would be so regression is a popular uh, is a very popularly used technique um, today but something that you may have already heard of and is also equally if not more popular is a neural network so even though a regression is uh, is represented as a mathematical function a neural network is a little bit different Instead of being represented purely as a mathematical function, it is a mix of a graph representation um, with mathematical elements in it. And when I say graph, I mean there are multiple layers of nodes, as you can see on this slide, um, with edges that connect those nodes. And each of those edges will have mathematical elements um, mixed in with them. So let me explain that a little bit better. So each neural network model is represented as layers of different nodes. So as you can see, in the first layer here, we have an input layer. We then have a hidden layer, and then we have an output layer. The input layers are essentially where you would, in, where you would enter the input of a data point. The hidden layer is where many calculations happen. And then the output layer is where the final output is given back to you. So this is kind of similar to how a regression function would work. When you have an x, y point, um, in a regression function, you plug in the x into the function and you receive an output. In a neural network, you plug in the inputs into the first nodes and then you perform, like a, you perform a, what's called propagation to essentially move those values forward through the layers of the neural network to achieve an output. What this allows is for a more complex model than a simple regression model. So 
What's important to identify here is that each connection between the layers of nodes has an associated weight and bias. That means when you, when you enter a value into, say, an input node, when that value is going to be propagated to the next layer, it must pass a connection to reach a node in the next layer. When it passes that connection, the value that was put into that node is then multiplied by the weight, and then the bias is added to that value. When you get that new value, that new value is what enters the node in the second layer of the neural network. So this is repeated for all of the different connections across the neural network. As this data propagates forward through the neural network, we end up with a final value that we can take as the output of the neural network. So at a node, all values coming from these connections are summed, which means that if a node has multiple connections that are coming from previous layers, those are all summed together, and then they're pushed forward to the next layer. So now that we understand how a simple uh, calculation of an output through an input works, we can then think about how we can optimize a model like this. So if you're given a lot of points of, of input and output pairs, you can then modify the weights and biases of each of these connections to optimize this model. So this is called forward and backward propagation. An input is sent through the network like we described earlier. And then the resulting output that we get from the neural network is set as the, ex the expected output. What we do then is we compare that expected output to the known output that we know from the, the, from the pairs. When we compare these, we can then calculate the error between the output that we got from the neural network and the output from the pair itself. Using this, we can tweak the model by adjusting the weights and biases accordingly. So that's how neural networks work. Now we're gonna look into something called the decision tree. This is a little bit more simpler to think about. Um, there's not as complex of a mathematical model behind it, but instead it's more of a, like a decision-making model. So whenever you work with the decision tree, the model is represented as a tree that can be traced down to find the output. So in this case uh, of the decision tree that I've posted here, this is whether or not we want to award a loan to, uh, to anybody who's applying for a loan at a bank. So when you're, when you're looking at an applicant for a loan at a bank, you'll be given a lot of data, such as the person's salary, um, how often they've been in their job, what their criminal record is, whether they make credit card payments on time. All of these data, all of these, like, uh, all of these dimensions in the data is what we would call features. So essentially, what we do then is we take a large set of data that we would have that are paired already, and we would split the data using these features. What we do then is we want to make sure that the split that we are doing effectively splits the data set almost equally, as close to equally as possible. This means that the feature that we are calculating can very much affect what the output is. Since if you, if you are looking at that feature, you know that the data set can vary differently depending on what, that, uh, what the value for that feature is. This is what we call information gain. If a feature split, meaning Let's look at this example. If an income range of an applicant is less than 30K, um, we now know that a certain subset of that, um, of that data will contain only people with an income of less than 30K. Now, if we know that that group of people is a large group, we can tell that checking whether their um, income range is below 30, uh, 30K has given us a lot of information by narrowing down the number of samples that could result in the correct, uh, the correct label. So that's why we call a feature split that gives distinct subsets of samples, like large distinct subsets of samples, high information gain. Now, if, you, with your, if within your data set, your feature split only narrows down like one, uh, one data point, then you know that that's not giving you a lot of information. So what you are gonna do is you're gonna want to split the data based on high information gain, um, and then take the two subsets of data points and repeat that uh, process back with the subsets. And what happens is then you recurse down this tree and you're able to create a tree structure that can result in narrowing down little by little what the label should be for a data point. So essentially, once you recurse and generate this tree, you basically will keep repeating this until the, the, sub, the subsets of the, like, the data points that you're considering are simply leaf nodes, meaning they're only one data point uh, or one output label, um, all within that one subtree. 
once you have gotten to that point, you realize that you have a tree that fully dictates all, what all of the different data decisions that you can make, um, which will result in different labels for the data. So one thing to note here is that the tree may not intuitively always make sense. But the reason we use machine learning in this case is to find um, decisions that humans would not conventionally make, but still those decisions can be very useful in evaluating this data. So those were pretty common examples of supervised learning that are used in today's, uh, in, in today's uh, industries. So let's move on to something called unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning is not as popular as supervised learning, um, but it also has immense amounts of power, depending on the system you're using it in. So with unsupervised learning, you're only feeding the system raw data points, meaning you're not going to be labeling the data points with anything. If we consider the MNIST uh, data, uh, data points from before, those MNIST data points, uh, which, are the, which are the drawings of handwritten digits, come with labels of what correct digit that we are uh, drawing. For unsupervised learning, you're working with data where there is no label. So imagine if the MNIST drawing database did not come with the correct, correctly labeled digit alongside of it. So in data systems like these, where there is no label to any of the data, the system cannot necessarily classify into finite classifications that are already labeled. So instead, the system must learn to identify and infer patterns in the data itself. So this is very useful when there is a large set of unlabeled data that needs to be grouped into different sections and clusters. So let's look at one type of unsupervised learning that is uh, arguably the most common type of unsupervised learning. Um, and this is what's known as clustering. So when we look at data, if a data, if, if a data point doesn't have a label, um, there's no way to specifically classify it using supervised learning. So this, in, this ex, in this example, we're going to be looking at um, iris flower species. So we're going to be looking at the petal width of an iris flower, the, the sepal length, uh, the sepal length and the petal length of that iris flower. So these different aspects of data points are what you would call features, and they represent different dimensionalities of the data. So if need be, as seen here, you can plot the data in a three-dimensional graph where each axis corresponds to a certain feature in the data. When we plot this data, we can see clearly, with our own eyes at least, that there are different clusters in this data. But at least to me, it only looks like there's really two clusters. If we don't pay attention to the color, we can tell that there's a small cluster down near the bottom right, and then there seems to be one large group near the top left. Now, we may not, as humans, see, those as, see that group of uh, points as two different clusters, but that's the power of unsupervised learning. So essentially, this data we can represent in this feature space, which is what this graph represents. What clustering does is it optimizes by finding the most likely groupings of data. So let's move on to reinforcement learning. So beyond supervised learning and unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning is another technique that people use, um, but it's not as popular in fields where you're dealing with large amounts of data. It rather focuses on temporal or decision-making processes. So the basis of reinforcement learning is when a system takes an action on its environment. When a system makes an action on an environment, um, we can provide a reward based on that action's effectiveness or how correct that action is. So what the system then does is it learns how to maximize reward by performing correct actions. If you reward positive actions with positive uh, consequences, then the system will continuously learn to exhibit more of those positive behaviors. So this is useful when you're creating an autonomous program of some sort or an agent to learn with direct experience. So rather than having a, a very large data set with pre-labeled data, if you want an agent to learn manually through its own experience, reinforcement learning is the method to choose. So in reinforcement learning, the problem is represented as a series of environment and agent states. The agent interacts with the environment and it has a set of its own actions. Whenever 
an agent takes this, uh, whenever an agent takes an action, that action can essentially give um, a reward. So when we look at the model for representation uh, of this problem, what we have is we have a policy. And a policy is simply a map of probabilities of what action an agent can take it at its current state. And essentially, whenever an, whenever an agent takes a certain action and, uh, and achieves a certain state, we can then consult what's called a value function. And that value function describes how good it is to be in that state, aka the reward. So one method of kind of dealing with reinforcement learning is the Monte Carlo method. So when we look at a, when we look at a, a policy, we know that there's a, distributed, there's a probability distribution of what actions that you can take. So for example, uh, if an agent has two directions to move in, in its current environment, um, those two directions may have random probabilities in the policy. That is exactly what the Monte Carlo uh, method does. You begin with a random distribution of probabilities, but you go through two kind of cycles. First, you evaluate the policy based on the value function. So you'll have to simulate every possible action that your agent can take at the current step and basically check what the reward value for each of these actions is. By doing that, you can, def you can define how to improve on your policy by adjusting for, uh, for actions that result in higher reward. Another way of uh, achieving reinforcement learning is through a familiar concept, the neural network. So as we showed earlier, the neural network is essentially a model that mixes um, a graphical representation and a mathematical representation. Um, but if we look at it from an outside perspective, it simply has inputs, it has an output, and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of weights and biases inside that can affect how those inputs map to those outputs. So in order to kind of adapt a neural network to reinforcement learning, um, what we can do is we can map those um, policies, uh, like the evaluation of the policy and the improvement of the policy um, to instead check the actions that are generated by the agent once more. But rather than adjusting the probability distribution, you adjust the weights and biases within the neural networks to indirectly affect the, the, the probability of which um, action is taken. Finally, for reinforcement learning, there's also a technique called the genetic algorithm. So this technique is not necessarily a model, but is an optimization technique that works well with simulation that I think might be relevant. So instead of iterating and adjusting a policy directly, like we discussed, like we, uh, discussed earlier, um, what we can do instead here is take the parameters of the policy. Um, so for example, in a neural network case, the parameters would be the weights and biases of the neural network. If we take those parameters and we construct them into a genome, um, and essentially that can be anything like just a string of all of those parameters just joined together, um, what we've now defined is a set of genes for one instance of this program. What we can then do is we can kind of adapt an evolutionary technique to this. We can essentially create a sample population of agents with randomized genes, meaning all of the parameters are randomized, and we basically create multiple instances of the same program to test. We then simulate the members of the population with the policy that are defined by their genes. So even if the policy is completely randomly generated, we simulate the agent in its correct, uh, in its, like, in its correct problem. And essentially, we can run the simulation to check whether or not um, the actions that the policy defines will, re will result on a positive, uh, will result in a positive, um, what is it called? A positive, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting the word here. Um, a reward. Yeah, a positive reward. So essentially, once, we've ha once we have this gene pool, um, we can then test every member of a population um, using the simulation that you have. We can then handpick the different agents that perform the best in this group or in this genome. When we do that, we can isolate which genes exactly result in a better reward when actually executing this program. Once we handpick those top performers, we can then use those genes to splice and generate new genes by using that string, um, maybe modifying it a little bit and generating new, very similar population. Um, and then we can rep repeat that process on the new population. So this is very similar to how natural selection in the world works now. Uh, so as, you know, as evolution works, essentially, 
favorable, favorable traits result in survival across many generations. By simulating that kind of survival, um, but except we, like our filtering method is using the rewards, we can essentially artificially create um, uh, like an evolutionary type of technique. And this will essentially allow um, the algorithm to optimize over many, many generations. So by running different generations with uh, varying amounts of population, with different starting genes, a lot, uh, as well as maybe introducing randomness into the genes at some point, you can eventually result in kind of converging on an optimal strategy over many, many generations of simulation. So now that we've talked about a lot of the basic, like uh, at least the basic concepts for a lot of these machine learning uh, techniques, which may not seem super basic, um, but yeah, that, that's a, a lot of these techniques, um, they have a lot of kind of complex models. Um, I just kind of wanted to outline a lot of them for you. But these, there's some concepts that kind of fit across all different types of machine learning models. So fitting is one thing that's very important when it comes to creating um, a machine learning model or even just assessing how a machine learning model will perform. So the data and method of training with the machine learning model, no matter what type of model it is, can cause issues. And these issues can be overfitting and underfitting the data. So underfitting um, in machine learning is whenever a model doesn't adequately, um, adequately uh, represent what the actual like, ground truth of the situation is. So as you can see in this graph, if we, have this, uh, if we have this type of distribution on this graph, if we were to perform a linear regression or polynomial regression, we would essentially end up with a curved line that should fit this, uh, that should fit this graph, but instead we are resulting with just a simple straight line that is kind of approximately identifying what this problem might be. Um, this can result from a many, like from many different factors. So this can happen due to not enough data, um, and you can try to collect more data or generate more useful data in order to combat this. Um, this can also happen because the data doesn't have enough features, um, meaning like different uh, aspects to the data or different dimensions to the data. This can also happen if you don't train the data enough, meaning you don't run it for a long enough time or you don't iterate enough times to reduce that error to get an accurate function. On the other hand, there's also a, there's also a problem of overfitting data. So this occurs when you have a certain set of data, but you train the model repeatedly over and over again on that same set of data and what the model does is it learns to hyper adjust for every little, uh, every bit of noise in that data. So looking at this graph, we know that, we know that likely the ground truth of this problem is not this odd squiggly line here. The likely solution is something that's more well fit, but in this case, the uh, machine learning algorithm will overfit the data to try to achieve the lowest error on every possible point, even though that may not be the best solution for, um, for the general, uh, mass amount of points in this, uh, in, in like this kind of problem. So this can happen when you have too much repetitive data, um, which basically means that the machine learning algorithm will kind of focus only on the factors of data that you have at hand. Um, this can also happen when the data has redundant features. So if it has lots of different features, um, you may end up with a very, very high feature count in the data, which can also result in an overfitting type of solution. And a way you can fix this is by reducing the number of dimensions in the data um, so that we only kind of maintain the useful dimensions. Yeah, and another thing that can happen is when you overtrain with all of your data that you have present. Um, one way to kind of combat overfitting is to split your data into multiple separate uh, groups where one group of your data is like a training set. So you train your data only on that and you use, an, you use a separate independent group of data for testing. So that way your testing data is outside of your training data. This can prevent your model from overfitting to only the data that you supply it. So obviously this is what a good fit should look like. If you properly make sure that your data only has relevant features and you train with your training set and test with a separate testing set and you find a good balance on how much to train, this is ideally what you would, what you would want out of a machine learning model. You want a model that is a good representation of the ground truth of the problem, not just the data points that you have at hand. So with all of this information in mind, um, that's a lot to remember, I know. So we're going to go back and revisit the examples that I mentioned earlier in the frame of these uh, different kind of techniques. 
So let's, let's talk about the handwritten digits recognition. So we can now see that handwritten digits recognition is a supervised learning problem. I explained earlier that the MNIST database has labeled sets of data. So labeled sets of data work well with supervised learning. We also know that this is a classification problem since there's a finite number of labels that each data point can achieve, namely zero through nine. What we can then do is use this labeled data to train a supervised model, um, such as a regression model or a neural network like we, dis uh, like we discussed earlier, to classify a given image into those labels. So next we can take a look at email spam filtering. So email spam filtering, um, it may be hard to generate labeled data sets for this, um, primarily due to spam being created almost every day. Um, especially because spam is kind of evolving. A lot of spam messages will change, but we need to still be able to identify spam messages that are coming in daily. Um, so a good way to do this is rather than trying to like use a classification problem, we can try to reframe this as a clustering problem. So this is where unsupervised learning would come in handy. So we can, we can select features for the data or dimensions, um, such as the sender of the email, the subject of the email, the content of the email and many other different aspects of a certain email. And we can create a feature space with that, meaning we can plot a mail in a, in a, in a multi-dimensional space that is dictated by those features. When we plot this data, we can then see what kind of emails are plotted close together in separate clusters. Using machine learning, we can then train to identify the different clusters whereas one cluster can be identified as spam mail and another cluster can be identified as a normal important mail. When we have a clustering algorithm, we know that whenever we introduce a new mail or a new email or a new data point to that model, we can easily see which cluster that that, uh, that email will fall under. So we can revisit our final example now. Personalized news recommendations is a different problem entirely. So this kind of problem does not necessarily have a data set. Instead, we have to rely on the experience of the user. Uh, namely, if a user is browsing certain news articles, um, depending on their engagement to that news article, that's the information that a machine learning model can kind of get in order to train itself. So in this case, reinforcement learning is the best bet. We know that you can use prior activity as an input to an environment state. Um, namely, if a, if a user is you know, engaging um, in a certain news article, you can basically provide that as a positive reward. So what, you, what we can do is we can essentially start with a random policy. So say a user downloads the new Google News app uh, initially. When it starts off, they'll most likely have random news articles that are just in the top news uh, for that day um, suggested to them. And you start off with that kind of random news, uh, news cycle, but as the user clicks on certain news uh, articles, you can basically check which kind of articles that the, uh, that the user is clicking on and basically reward the algorithm with positive rewards for those kinds of uh, algorithms or those kinds of news articles. So by calculating this kind of uh, reward through user en engagement, you can essentially train this, uh, this reinforcement learning policy um, to identify new news articles that each user might be interested in. So now we've kind of gone over just generally a lot of machine learning topics. So how does this relate to, to a material science? So in material science, machine learning may help detect patterns in data that um, people may not as easily be able to see. It may also be able to expedite research by helping researchers eliminate uh, or estimate material properties. It can also help consolidate data from many different sources. So here's like an example um, that I was able to read about. We can actually apply machine learning um, for material property prediction. So if a certain material um, has a set of predefined properties, and we know that those properties are affecting a different property that you're that you attempting to research, um, if we're able to gather a large set of data that essentially uh, maps those existing properties to the new property, you can generate a sort of labeled data set. If you can map that labeled data set to a supervised learning model, um, since supervised learning models work well with labeled data sets, you can then train a function to basically estimate the value of that, new, uh, of that new property without ever having to test it initially. 
while this may not be uh, un- like this may not be 100% uh, reliable on the first go the machine learning algorithm can very much help uh, take help make these efforts uh, happen faster so by unifying the efforts and the data collected by lots of researchers around the world we can kind of we can allow these kinds of discoveries to happen on a quick at a quicker pace by allowing a machine learning algorithm to screen a lot of these uh, research uh, a lot of this data prior to human intervention after which a human can then go back and essentially kind of review this data and make meaningful conclusions uh, through the help of that machine learning algorithm. So then another, uh, uh, like another um, situation that we could use machine learning in, in material sciences, um, if you are optimizing, the, prop- uh, optimizing like the materials properties for a use case. So if a certain material needs to be chosen for a specific project or use case, um, we can create a population of data points with those relevant material properties, right? Essentially, what we can do is we can kind of emulate that genetic algorithm type of uh, machine learning al- uh, algorithm, where we essentially can create a, uh, a set of agents, um, each which represent a different set of properties. By essentially kind of converting these properties into a genome, we can simulate, uh, we, can, you, we can use like uh, material science simulations to simulate these properties in that use case. By doing so, we can also pick um, and we, we can pick and identify the top performers um, of each kind of like um, property, and we can use this to decide what material might sp- work work well for a specific use case. So, provided this does only work if there is like a simulation method for this use case, but given you can simulate um, like simulate certain properties of materials in certain use cases or for certain products, you will be able to use that simulation result as a re- like as a reward for reinforcement learning. By framing a problem in this way, rather than having to test manually um, using simulation methods, we can allow a machine learning algorithm to dictate how to test and how to simulate certain materials for certain products, and it may it may able to be or it may may be able to help humans kind of identify what type of properties um, are favorable in different use cases in ways that maybe even humans would not be able to see in the first place. So overall, I think that machine learning has lots of different implications in the use of material science, um, even, if there, even if it may not work in every scenario. And to be honest, that's how machine learning works in almost every industry, um, which is why it's important for people like you, who are you know, people who are very um, good at ma- uh, material science, to understand how, at least at a basic level, machine learning works. Because machine learning, at, at, least, uh, at least understanding how machine learning works, can very much help you guys understand how to frame a problem and maybe even help solve it a lot faster than you could now. So yeah, um, that's all I've got to talk about. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Um, yeah. Very informative, illuminating, clear to the point. Thank you, sir, for your insightful lecture. We proceed to the question and answer round. Uh, you can ask your queries by typing in the chat box. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, let me, I'll scroll through a lot of these questions if I can, uh, in the order that they were received. Let's see. Okay. Thank you to everybody um, who enjoyed the session. Um, I see a lot of, you know, a lot of comments. Um, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. So for Monte Carlo methods, um, if uh, if I have any links for Monte Carlo methods, I'll be sure to forward them to uh, Dr. Sophia, um, and I think she'll be able to kind of uh, send that to you. Is that okay? I don't have any on hand at the moment, but I'll be able to kind of uh, hopefully send those out after. Um, um, so. There was a question about whether um, a simulation can be used for X-ray absorption studies. Um, can get can I get like um, information on what exact simulation you were referring to? Uh, one second. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Joel, sir, uh, would yeah. Shall I explain it to you? Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, it. Yeah. 
so people are in general asking you about uh, whether yeah. this uh, machine learning can be used in simulations for example yeah. this participant has asked uh, something about x ray absorption studies but okay. like in uh, other cases uh, we do uh, simulate a lot of experiments uh, for example uh, we do a kind of 100 experiments and we have the data with us the results with us awesome okay yeah then after some time we would like to simulate uh, yeah. uh, that particular experiment by giving uh, a different kind of inputs we want uh, the system to you know give us the results based on what we already uh, gave to the system so if we okay. can you know if we want to uh, do that kind of simulation uh, yeah. if we uh, this machine learning will be useful in what way it can be useful awesome okay yeah so i can answer that um for sure um simulation is something that machine learning can be very helpful in so if you have a lot of data um that's especially very useful for machine learning um considering a lot of data is what can drive a model to actually be able to correct itself so in the case of having existing data points um where you know you have like some kind of inputs and that results in the output of a simulation um if you want to essentially use machine learning to kind of uh be able to simulate new and different points that's where something like supervised learning would come into handy so let me see if i can go to a slide about supervised learning and we can take a look at that real fast yeah so this is what um this is what uh, okay i guess i'll just go here Okay, I'll just flip through. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so supervised learning is essentially, like I said, um, a good technique to use when you have data that can be labeled. So, for example, um, if in your simulations you are able to identify what inputs um, result in what kind of output from a simulation, um, that's essentially how you would label a data set. So, essentially, like if you are able to keep a table of all the inputs that you have and the corresponding output um and that would be like one data point if you are able to collect a lot of data in that format um you would then be able to kind of explore how supervised learning can help you kind of um map all of those input features um into like the output of the simulation so it may be difficult to like um to like map like something that's very complex just because a lot of complex things take a lot of data and a lot of training but at least it might be useful to be able to kind of simulate like small simpler processes without having to actually manually do the experiments so that might be something that's uh, interesting to look into so for that i would definitely recommend learning about neural networks um neural networks are like one of the most popular methods of doing uh, supervised learning um i'm like a lot of people talk about neural networks in the field of machine learning and that's because there's a lot of promise for them and there's a lot of different ways to implement them so if you're interested in trying to map a lot of different inputs to um like an output and kind of generate um like a machine learning model that can simulate things like that then i would i would uh, suggest definitely researching more into neural networks so yeah uh, let me see if i can open the chat up again okay Okay, let's see. Uh Okay. So, uh I see a question, is it possible to study all properties of materials related to mate magnetic materials, electrical properties, etc.? So um yeah that's like i would say it's possible to study almost the relationships between almost any data so for sure you could study um the properties of materials when it comes to magnetic materials or electrical properties um the only requirement for studying is that you kind of would need a lot of data to make this happen so if for example um there's a lot of existing data on different how different um like materials react to like 
uh, or different materials have different magnetic properties and different electrical properties. Um, that may be able to provide insight on how to create a, like a machine learning model that could perhaps estimate some of these properties given other properties of that same material. Okay. Uh, uh, sir, there are uh, some viewers from uh, YouTube stream. So okay. there yeah, are a yeah. few questions there. I would like to read it out for you. Yeah, uh, for sure. Someone has, yeah, Miss Hannah Jennifer, she has asked you uh, like this. What is okay. the best machine learning platform to create our model if we are a beginner in this field? Okay, great question. Um, so there's a lot of beginner tools you can get, um, like uh, that you can kind of start with. Um, Personally, um, I'm a computer science kind of person, so I, I work a lot with Python, um, which is a programming language that's used pretty commonly. Um, if you're willing to like learn a little bit of Python, a good, like a, a good library to start with is TensorFlow. Um, so you can look into, I would recommend looking up TensorFlow or at least writing that down or like noting that. Um, TensorFlow is a, is a library by Google, which offers a lot of machine learning tools already built in. So even if you don't understand like all of the mathematical intricacies of each machine learning model, um, TensorFlow will allow you to kind of uh, at least explore different machine learning models um, using like tools that they already have provided. So you can look at TensorFlow, that's one. Um, another thing is PyTorch, um, which is also like a, it's also like a beginner's kind of library. Um, both of these libraries are very good at providing existing models that you can kind of use as examples or try to learn from. Um, as well as giving you the option to create your own models without having to code the theory behind all of the concepts. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from the YouTube stream? Uh, yeah, so someone uh, from this room, they have asked, can we implement this in surface okay. coating application with composite materials? So, uh, can you repeat uh, that? Yeah, yeah. I would uh, like to uh, uh, tell this again to you. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, we do uh, lots of uh, coatings. Okay. Using different materials mm -hmm. and using different methods. And okay. then we study uh, how our surface uh, coatings are working. Okay. So now uh, yeah. we have a kind of uh, so much of data with us because many of us have done uh, lots and lots of work, mm -hmm. but uh, still uh, we won't be able to conclude that fast because we mm -hmm. still do not know which is good and which is the best. Yeah. So probably if we have such kind of data, for example, I used so-and-so material, I got this kind of property. So mm -hmm. if I have such kind of data with me, mm -hmm. uh, will I be able to work upon it? And uh, will I be able to uh, build a model? You know, what is your say about it? I think that's the question. Yeah, um, actually, yes. That's also a very suitable project for machine learning. So it seems like, if you have different types of coatings for different materials and you want to evaluate how well they do, um, that's also something that, that sounds like something you might be able to do with something akin reinforcement learning. Um, so essentially you can kind of create like a neural network um, using like the inputs and in different, like the different inputs um, that you would need. Um, but the output of that like coding can be kind of like assigned to like the, like how, I guess like how well like a uh, something would like how well like that sort of coding would perform um, for that material. Um, so like there are a couple of ways you could do this. You could just use supervised learning and kind of build the same type of model like that, like I was explaining earlier. Um, but what I need to explain, I guess that is uh, a little bit like difficult to kind of explain is that it's possible to do a lot of things with machine learning in this format. Like if you have a lot of data and you have like inputs that may map to certain outputs, um, it is definitely possible to create a model that can kind of represent that. But the most difficult part of, I guess, working on machine learning is kind of figuring out what model actually works the best or figuring out 
what kind of um, like hyperparameters is what um, they're called might result in the best model. So for example, um, in this page that I'm showing right now, there's um, like a neural network here, right? And you can see that there's two input nodes. There's three um, nodes inside of the hidden layer, and there's only one node for the output. So this specific structure for a neural network will not work for like every type of problem. So if we look at the MNIST um, thing that I was explaining before, um, just for an example, um, where you have like an image that basically represents like a digit and then you have like an output actual number, um, a way to do that, like using a neural network, we wouldn't be able to use this structure. You would instead have to have um, the number of inputs of the number of pixels in that image. So that's a lot of different inputs, right? A lot of input nodes. Um, and then you may need a certain number of hidden layers. So maybe even one hidden layer is not enough. You might need to add another hidden layer, um, each of them with a different number of nodes. Um, and then the output layer will have to have 10 nodes, like one for each um, digit. And then when you get one of those, each of those digits, uh, or like when you look at each of those output nodes, you can figure out which node resulted in the highest value. And that's how you would select the classification bin. So in that example, that's like one way of kind of designing the neural network to fit the problem at hand. So like being that being said, like it's possible to like tackle a lot of the problems that are um, that are in that kind of problem format that we discussed, where like you have input data, you have labeled data that has um, mappings from an input to an output. It's definitely possible to do it. But what I just explained is what people call hyperparameter tuning. And that is a very like crucial, but also difficult part of creating a machine learning algorithm. And that can essentially take a lot of time and research to understand how to do properly. So even I don't really know exactly, depending on your situations, how you would have to tune the hyperparameters to get the best model. Um, that needs to be done through kind of like practice and you know trial and error. There's a lot of like um, time that you have to put into researching how to properly create a model that may even work. Um, so that I would say is like the only thing that would be kind of like hard to do um, for these kinds of problems. Once you can develop a model, once you have like a, like a, like a model that works sufficiently well, um, that like model um, and the knowledge that that model can bring can be deployed in your field and can be useful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, can I read uh, one more question for you? Yeah, sure. From the YouTube, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mr. G. U. Uh, Raju has asked this question. Okay. To apply machine learning in optimizing the control variables in material properties, yeah. what is the typical data size? That is, uh, how many like number of experiments or data, what is the typical data size that okay, okay, we okay. should have? Good question. So, um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of domain knowledge for material science. So like, I, I don't know um, exactly what that problem may entail, um, but as like a general answer, oftentimes um, machine learning does require like very large sets of data. So like the MNIST database I showed had like 70,000 like data points and that was with reason. Um, without like a large number of data, like a large like number of data points at least, um, the model may not be able to train sufficiently enough. So it really depends on the type of model that you're using and like, um, like I guess how much, what like the dimensionality of that model is. But I would say like you would need to even get, like to even begin, you would need at least a couple thousand data points to like make a meaningful model. Um, but even if you have like less data points like that, even if you only have like a hundred data points or something, um, it may be worth just trying to create a model anyway, just to see where it takes you. Because oftentimes, um, even having a large amount of data doesn't guarantee function. It just depends on like how much information that data really contains. Um, and sometimes even small data sets would, can contain enough information to help a model train properly. Um, but if there's like a good number of like different parameters um, to that data, um, you would probably need like, um, you would probably need in the thousands of data points. Huh. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. H. Jeevan Rao, uh, okay. he's asking you a question. Sir, to start this mind like uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, 
uh, you know if we have to prepare for all these things where do we start with what kind of uh, basic programming platform that we should have with us and what should be learned i think okay. you answered uh, yeah previously yeah. so would you would like to yeah yeah i can go over it again yeah um so machine learning is yeah like the like a lot of the machine learning platforms available um are usually in uh, like are usually in python um and so python is a programming language that um is pretty popularly used um um you can kind of i think you you should be able to download python on most computers um there shouldn't be any barrier for that um but you can download python and you can work with tools called tensorflow and pytorch um those two are very popular tools that people use to kind of implement machine learning models um at least locally on like local machines um and essentially that will allow you to kind of like if you have a lot of um data that's like in some digital format um you can use python um since python is just a programming language um you can kind of learn a little bit of python to learn how to um import that data however you have it stored into your program and then basically format that data well for like machine learning um once you format it and like kind of you know imported that data then you can use the libraries that are um pytorch and and um tensorflow um to essentially like set up some of these machine learning models um using like those platforms um you can set those up and then you can use the data that you've imported to like train the models and you can test out like the the models using data that you have and stuff like that um so yeah like i would recommend getting started with python and i would recommend researching either tensorflow or pytorch thank you sir one last question uh, from mr uh, srinivas uh, so he is working on uh, developing uh, materials with uh, good wear properties uh, it it means that like when we use the material then it has to go for you know longer duration it shouldn't mm, yeah. uh, get worn off so he has uh, some kind of choice like material a or material b so okay. would machine learning help him to choose which material is better yeah actually that yeah that that's something that you can adapt machine learning to help for that problem um so like if you have like different types of materials and they have what you can do is you can collect data on the different properties of that material for, like maybe um and essentially if you're able to kind of like simulate like the the wear of like material or at least estimate the wear of material um you can then try to map like different properties of that material to whether or not that material can last a long time if you're able to generate a data set like that um where you're mapping those properties to like the wear of the material um you might be able to actually train a machine learning model that's able to take an input of like whatever properties you chose of that material and provide an estimate for like the wear and tear of that material So that's something that could happen um but again it all depends on like how much data there is available and um whether that data is like uh, informative enough to do so but yeah yeah uh thank you very much sir uh, i think all of us are uh, very excited and many of them want like they want to start learning somewhere but yeah. we really do not know where to start with <laughs> so we are asking you many different questions and some yeah. of them are asking you would you you know give us some kind of uh, training on this subject or they are <laughs> asking you will you give me uh, some kind of link from where we can you know learn how to correlate this uh, machine learning and material science so mm -hmm. uh, i would uh, really you know like to request to read, uh, talk to us and yeah. we are surely looking for uh, such kind of collaborations in the future thank you very much sir i especially thank you on behalf of uh, our institute bharat institute of engineering and technology the management and the faculty members thank you very much sir yeah thank you all um, also for listening and it's always a pleasure to share knowledge that i've gained um and i've always loved talking about this kind of technology especially because it can have a huge impact on almost any industry so um I'll definitely look into different kinds of links and different resources that I can kind of send out or perhaps like um point everybody in the right direction. Um and yeah, I would love to come back maybe talk about something else as well. Thank you so much. I request all the participants to fill the feedback form for today's session. 
I once again thank our keynote speaker, Mr. Joel, and all our wonderful participants. A big thank you from BIET team. The session continues tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Thank you.